look, I know you have one of the best jobs in health, most important jobs in health, and one of the worst. Mm -hmm. um, and, and everyone looks at CMS for answers and okay. rules and making everything fair, mm -hmm. reimbursability, paying for these things. And I, and I, and I know that one of the biggest um, uh, you know, uh, objectives you have right now is, is to address equity mm -hmm. and to address access and to even out that opportunity. And I guess my starting unfair question is, how do you make the world out there believe that you're serious? So it is the best job. And I honestly feel so privileged to be in this role. And at this time, I've been thinking a lot about um, just the era we live in, right? And I think that COVID-19 has exposed what it means to us as a country to have mm. inequities. And I think there is a different level of dialogue. That is a, a moment in time, and it's a brief moment. But I think there's just a different awareness. And as you probably know, I was in the Obama administration. The Affordable Care Act is where you know my heart is. We did not use the words health equity during that time. People didn't talk about it. And now that is so much at the forefront of everyone that comes to talk to me. Me. And so I think the way we take this moment and make it meaningful to last beyond my tenure is by making sure in every decision we are thinking about what are the impacts on the people who are underserved as well as the providers that provide care for the underserved. And that's a piece that I think um, is, is really important in, in this discussion because I think as so many people see an opportunity, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I think uh, a lot of the industry has embraced this idea mm -hmm. of health equity. We want to make sure the actual people that care for people who are underserved are right. really part of this conversation. Right. And so by that, I mean the community organizations, yeah. I call sort of them health adjacent, where right. they are often the ones that connect people to care, the FQHCs, the providers that really right. serve the underserved, to make sure as we think about our Medicare payment policies, as we try to enroll people, that they are really a part of this conversation. Right. And so, so one of the questions I have, and, I, and I'm a lay person, so yeah. I just pretend to be a health policy wonk, mm -hmm. but I get a lot wrong. So if I frame this wrong, um, please correct me. And I think one of the big issues is when the Affordable Care Act came mm -hmm. in, as I understood it, the big transition was to move to a model of wellness and away from fee for service within the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And while I know that that's not necessarily CMS land, I am interested in how CMS land and the Medicare Medicaid program look at wellness or whether their contractors and providers are still operating in a fee-for-service world because you've been elevating mental health. And mm -hmm. mental health is always this thing out there that I think is so important. But in a lot of um, American health providers have a hard time laying out the economic foundation for robust mental health services. Mm -hmm. So I know that's a long way around of saying, how do you, how do you deal with the wellness uh, orientation within the world that you have, mm -hmm. control of gravity, and where is mental health in that? So I would say we are very much a part of this conversation about how do we move away from just treating acute um, catastrophic events. And when you think about the population that we serve, we now have over 150 million people that are covered it's by our programs. It's catastrophic events are us. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, if we, and, uh, and, um, and mental health is a core part of um, uh, certainly of care, but really the people that we care for. So when you think about the crisis in this country on mental health, it's particularly in our elderly, mm -hmm. people who are in nursing homes, um, and the, on the other end, kids. And Medicaid and CHIP cover a lot of the children in this country. Mm -hmm. And so I would say a couple of things. We're really thinking about um, in our innovation center, C um, CMMI, how we can develop models that really encourage more holistic care, mm -hmm. certainly through our health plans, whether it's in Medicare, whether it's in ACA marketplace coverage, whether it's in Medicaid, really trying to make sure there is more of a holistic perspective. And that's one of the things we are really focused on, making about the person and less about 
a particular model for providers and really trying to make sure that we are keeping people at the center of it. And then to, f to focus on mental health, this is a place where we are trying hard to work with other partners. So certainly um, the other parts of, the, uh, of HHS, mm. like SAMHSA, like HRSA, I spend a lot of time with my colleagues there really thinking about at the state level, how can we coordinate care better? Because you do have grant programs that serve mental health um, uh, services that could be better coordinated, say, with the Medicaid program, um, and then continuing within our own program authority. So telehealth for mental health services is something that in Medicare um, we've just extended permanently. Medicare does cover a lot of mental health services in this country, and we're trying to use our authority in the, in the ways that we can to try to better it. You know, I've been it. looking a lot at um, America's broadband picture mm -hmm. and who's not digitally connected. Yes. And you go out and take a look at that, and we've done some geospatial mapping mm -hmm. uh, of that, and you kind of blew, overlay that with you know, health um, outcomes and performance, and you look at the rural-urban divide, yeah. or you look at uh, information deserts or food deserts inside cities, mm -hmm. guess what, they're health deserts too. Yeah. So a lot of these problems that you're wrestling with are systemic and other of your partners in government are wrestling with them too. Yes. Can't you all get together and just fix it? <laughs> Well, we do spend a lot of energy trying to coordinate. And, you know, these programs have different congressional authority, and sometimes we have the ability to make these changes. Sometimes we're going to need um, congressional perspective. But we are trying as hard as we can to, to coordinate where we, where we can. And you are absolutely right. You know, we, we've seen our, uh, our colleagues at Age of Justice did a study on telehealth and found, yes, in some areas, mm. great. In other areas, black and Latino um, uh, people are using, um, are, are have less access to, uh, to, to video. And in rural areas where we need it the most, we're not seeing as much as the telehealth. What, what, so what is happening, look, and, and again, as a layperson, mm -hmm. what I understand is that the um, reimbursability of telehealth during COVID was sound, mm -hmm. and we may be getting wobbly mm. today. Is that, I don't know if that's a fair assessment, but why are we getting wobbly, and is it CMS's fault? It is not CMS's fault. Um, CMS has uh, limited authority, and uh -huh. so where we have uh, used our authority is we can um, make mental health services permanent, right. um, telehealth. Congress has extended telehealth beyond um, the public health emergency uh, for for five months, and that's something we need Congress to do. So while we're in so a after that five months expires, a lot of services that people have grown yes. used to in telehealth may be ones that are no longer paid for. That's right, and we do not have a. Th we are. Wouldn't uh, that, isn't that going to be like a tsunami hitting the health system? We are concerned. Um, and How concerned? DEFCON level. You know, so the, my biggest concern is around the unwinding, um, huh. around the public health emergency of, um, of coverage and Medicaid. We are at record levels of people enrolled in Medicaid and CHIP um, and marketplace coverage. And because of the public health emergency, uh, people have been on the Medicaid program um, without what we call redeterminations. And that is a process that um, often loses people. And... It is imperative on all of us across all stakeholders to really focus on this. We are working with states to try to make sure that we hold on to coverage. But coverage is not, I like to say, necessary, not sufficient, right, for making sure that people have access to care. And the difference in people not having um, care is what uh, I, I would say we are most concerned about with the public health. I, I ask this respectfully, and I don't know, you know do your colleagues at CMS are they doing all that can be done around drug price negotiation, around, you know, thinking about, you know, costs of care, of uh, thinking about how science is transforming methodologies and creating new opportunities that I hear sometimes do not fit within the Medicare, uh, Medicaid uh, parameters. Are there, should, should we be putting more pressure on your colleagues to find ways to work with the innovation sector or to work with um, things to, to both address, I, I guess the big tensions I feel out there, and I, you know, we have the pharma folks up here, are between grabbing science, delivering more opportunities, mm -hmm. but making sure it's more equitably shared and distributed 
at a cost that makes sense for the country. Do you, you know what I'm saying? I know what you're yeah, and, saying. And, I, and I'm not putting this on you, right. but I, you, you run a huge organization that's okay. out there. Yeah. And so what should we as taxpayers and citizens be expecting on that front? This is something that we are absolutely trying to address in making sure that people are getting access to the innovative products that are coming on the market, which are exciting. I would say a couple of things, and then of course, people always want to put pressure on us, which we welcome. I, you know, that's how all. much do you welcome? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I would say on devices in particular, that's a place where yeah. we, CMS, have been working with the FDA for really 20 years to try to streamline the process. We had a number of discussions, stakeholder open discussions over the last couple of months, and that is um, an area where we have said at the end of, by the end of this year that we're going to put out um, rulemaking to really try to streamline that process of these emerging um, devices, and it's it's really an area of of attention and focus. That's really around the Medicare program. I think also I encourage people to really look to the states. There are so many things mm -hmm. that are coming that really serve a younger population, and it's not always the Medicare's focus to cover some of these innovative products, let's just say, you know, pro uh, innovations that really affect births, right, or children, really making sure that we are engaging, that industry is right. engaging with states who make a lot of these decisions and with private payers who in the marketplace have a lot of flexibility. So that's the other piece that I would say that sometimes I think people come to the government and not that we shouldn't be absolutely incorporating this, but we're not the only game in town, even in our programs. There mm -hmm. are actually other entities that are a part of this conversation that need to be engaged. You know, I'm interested in show and tell um, in the sense that whether or not you've been able to identify a rural area, a Native American area, a, a, a community um, that has traditionally been left out of the health outcome opportunities of, you know, Beverly Hills or mm -hmm. something, you know, yeah. and, and so when you look at that, if someone's been able to kind of change their stars a bit and figure it out, and whether or not you've been able to kind of find some of those stories and share them and learn from them, are they out there or are they really elusive? They are out there. I've been doing more traveling as of the last couple of months and was in Cleveland, Ohio, visiting um, a, uh, a, a just this organization that I was so excited about. They're very focused on maternal and infant health. Mm -hmm. And really seeing the city officials, all of the stakeholders around the room. I mean, not to interrupt, but our maternal um, we mortality have rates are insanely bad. They are right? horrible. Yeah. And, you know, the vice president has made this a priority. We are um, very, she and I personally have been very engaged. What does it mean that she's made it a priority? What can she do? Absolutely. So just to start, in December, she pulled together um, a, a White House discussion. And I think people were so, I spoke with stakeholders the day after, and people were so moved that maternal mortality was actually getting this level mm. of attention. Uh, you know, and, and women actually telling these terrible stories about everything being fine um, as their daughter um, was delivering and then a couple of hours later they hear their daughter is dead because mm. of hemorrhaging that wasn't um, controlled for. So it, it, she has made this a whole of government approach, mm. pulled together a maternal health cabinet where all of us are on the hook for um, producing um, uh, initiatives. We at um, CMS obviously have a big role in this. So what, some of the things we've been and doing. Are, are you able to write about this, show this, and say, hey, yes. folks, here's some best and promising methods? That's right. So we've been yeah. announcing these um, maternal health blueprints. Um, more information will be coming out very shortly from us, CMS, about the work we're doing. We've been working with states on postpartum coverage, which is one of the key, not only, but um, a key issue. I, as a mother, say, like two months after you give birth, the last Last thing you're trying to figure out is switching health insurance. Mm. Well, millions of people have to do that. Right. And so we're seeing states who are expanding coverage through the 12 month postpartum period, which is a huge game changer oh. in terms of making sure that women, that babies actually go to the doctor. You know, I asked somebody um, earlier this morning, what was the most important thing I could talk to you about? And, and they gave me you know, the, the, the worst, most boring topic, and I've avoided it until now, and we have 36 seconds. But, um, <laughs> but they said payments. Payments reform oh, yes. 
is like, and I just, my eyes glaze over when I hear it, but I know it's a huge issue in your world. Why is it a huge issue? Why is it so boring to all of us? And, and, and why should it matter um, in, in a big way? I mean, you know, I, I just want you to turn us on with some answer on payments and tell us why it's such a big I deal. love that you asked this question and then you said how boring it is because <laughs> I say the same thing to the team. Nobody wants to hear we're going to change the payment rates for providers and make them do blah, blah, blah. What people want to hear is how it is going to change care. And so right. what I would say is what we are focused on is trying to make sure that our payment policies give incentives for people to have more holistic care. And that's what we're focused on. The way um, our traditional fee-for-service statute is written, it doesn't always do that. And so we are trying to make sure that our payment reforms really give incentives to a whole range of providers to provide more holistic care. Back to your point about mental health. That primary mm -hmm. care, that some of these su special supports dementia, making sure caregivers are cared for, that we actually give incentives for people to provide those services, not just you come to the doctor and get your blood pressure checked. I appreciate it, and I'm still awake, so thank you for that answer. <laughs> Chiquita Brooks-Lasur, Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, thank you thank so you much. Me.